We're going to start the Frontier meeting at 6.01, March 1st, 2022 at 6.01. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to have a public hearing on the proposed FY23 budget for Frontier Regional. And I'll turn it over to Darius and Shelly. Yes. <laughs> hey, Bill, do you have anything you want to? Oh, Bill, I'm sorry, Bill. Bill, then Bill, it's, okay. it's okay, Bob. I don't take it personally. <laughs> sorry, buddy. I was just, just going to hand the ball to Shelly and let her run. So, Jerry, do you have anything you want to say before I get started? No, I like to comment afterwards. <laughs> okay. Clean up my mess. <laughs> All right, I'm going to share. My screen. So I did send this presentation out to the committee earlier today. Um, and anyone that is representing any towns that's here, we're happy to send it out after the meeting. So you have the most current version as well. Um, so I'm going to just quickly go through our budget process and then talk about the numbers and then we'll get to the assessment. So the budget development process is multi-step. Um, we, of course, drive it based on student needs, being student-centered um, and building base needs. So we look at uh, input from stakeholders and school leadership with each step of the budget process. And we take a hybrid approach, making sure that we're looking at uh, level service funding as well as new initiatives. Um, so we take a look at existing staffing and programs in the new year to make sure that everything is going to be covered class-wise and, and based on student needs. Uh, and then we look at existing expense accounts to make sure that we have proper funding in those expense accounts. So whether we're fluctuating up or down, you know, if we've been overfunded in a particular line for several years and haven't used those funds, do they need to be reallocated to an account that has been overspent or do we need to add to an account that has been overspent in the past? Uh, we also consider new initiatives. So going into the new year, any new staffing needs we might have based on enrollment or student need. Um, any new programs that we want to roll out, we consider new initiatives as, as the next step. And then we look at other factors, such as special education expenses, which seem to be continuously fluctuating year to year. And we also look at our revolving funds, because a good chunk of our budget on top of the general fund is funded from revolving funds and grants. So we want to make sure that any expenditures being paid from those revolving accounts or grant funds can continue to be paid in the future based on what we know. Uh, so after that whole process, uh, we presented a first draft in January at a 5.72% increase, which was almost $700,000. Uh, that did include three new positions, one faculty position and two support positions. And then we also made adjustments to uh, expense lines based on anticipated costs. So uh, a couple examples of that were over the past two school years, we have added additional sports programs. Uh, they had been added after the budget was already created, so we need to account for those in the new year as part of the new budget. Uh, we've also added several software programs and uh, networking and curriculum support for technology pieces over the last several years, and so we needed to right-side some of those accounts so that we had proper funding. Um, we also saw an increase in uh, transportation costs for special education and our out of district placement. Additionally, we have uh, increase in retirement contributions. So our sick buyback um, to retiring teachers is included in here. And then also an increase in our assessment with um, Franklin Regional Retirement. So those are pieces we really don't have a lot of control of. So going into the budget at 5.72, while we did have a few new initiatives, we also had these factors that were things that are just happening within the year or going into the new year that we knew that we're going to need adjustments. Um, so school committee spoke at that point. Uh, we didn't have a huge presentation in January because the subcommittee did meet and talk about next steps. Um, the administration was tasked with going back and coming up with ideas to make budget reductions. Uh, so we did, we went ahead and did that, George Darius and I, and we dropped the budget down to an increase of 3.64%. Uh, one of the first steps was to look at those three new positions that we were asking for and prioritize the needs. 
Um, so we did drop off two of those three positions and we are looking to continue to fund one of them in the new budget. And then as I explained previously, um, there weren't a lot of things that could be pulled off. We were simply talking about writing accounts and making sure that we had proper funding. So we needed to come up with another funding source. So we did move $134,500 onto revolving accounts so that we could help bring that budget increase down. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of things that we actually chopped off or cut from the budget. Uh, we really just reallocated our resources. So this budget presentation is our final draft as it stands right now for the public hearing at 3.64% increase, uh, looking at a total general fund budget of $12,237,498. Uh, we will use another roughly million dollars to fully fund our budget and that additional million dollars is from revolving revenue and grant monies for a total budget of 13.3 million for next school year. Uh, those, those funds there, that additional million dollars, that is not part of the assessment. So moving ahead and talking about the assessment. So the assessment is, it's not super complicated, but there's multiple parts to it. So we look at our whole budget as a start. We back out our chapter 70 aid, which for Frontier, uh, because we are in a hold harmless state with Massachusetts, uh, that essentially means our enrollment continues to go down. So we get the promise of at least our same funding from the prior year. Uh, the state is very generous and gives us an additional $30 per pupil on top of that. So you can see it's a minuscule calculation, about $16,000 additional that we're getting in chapter 70 funding from the prior year. Um, that is based on enrollment numbers from October of 2021 is what they look at for the 23 school year. So we're always behind. Um, so that enrollment number is based on 515 students for the Chapter 70 formula. And then we take the four town required contribution as uh, stated to us from the state in the Chapter 70 workbook. Um, the four town requir required contribution is dependent upon each town's uh, individual wealth. Uh, so it has to do with certain things of uh, enrollment from that particular town as part of the calculation. Also has to do with property values uh, and actual wealth of the community and then uh, taxes and things like that that the town generates. So overall town wealth is part of that calculation. We back those two pieces out and then consider other offsets that we can offer. Frontier does get regional transportation reimbursement from the state for our regional transportation, not our special education transportation. This number is up this year. You can see uh, last year it was 183,000. We are at 269,000. And that is because um, two years ago we did receive more regional transportation money than we budgeted for. So that surplus of 116,000 was put into a stabilization fund so that it could be credited directly back to the four towns through the assessment. So that's why there's such a significant increase there. State reimbursement is actually predicted right now in the governor's budget to go down compared to the prior year, um, but we were fortunate to have that funding to be able to add back in. And then the school committee is committed to helping offset the budget with some of our free cash. So we have 200,000 that we're pulling from E&D to continue to help offset. So the total assessment that we're looking at for the additional funds that are needed on top of the uh, four town required state contribution and any transportation costs over the state's reimbursement is about 3.5 million. So that 3.5 million gets broken down by a five-year rolling enrollment assessment. So you can see here the total enrollment over the five years that we're looking at is uh, 2,300 students. And then it's broken down individually by town. So how much of each of that is a percentage of the whole. So Conway's portion of that 3.5 million is 16.48, Deerfield 48.97, Sunderland 23.22, and Waitley 11.33. So what does that all mean in the grand scheme of things? I know that that's the most important part is, you know, what are we talking about for actual assessment numbers? So 
Um, Conway is going to see an increase in the assessment based on the current budget of 2.64% next year, or just over 40,000. Deerfield, an increase of 0.98%, or just over 40,000. Sunderland, 5.91 at 116,000. And Waitley is seeing a significant increase of 14.36% or 131,000. Um, again, those factors come in based on the state required contribution, the frontier operating expenses, which is broken out by that cost share percentage in the next chart or the chart above, and then the regional transportation, which is also broken out by the cost share percentage. Uh, and then I think the last piece on here is just the history. So you could see historically over the three years where the fluctuation has been. I think it's good for us to have that snapshot. You can see there are ebbs and flows. Some towns have had credits. Um, for example, last year, Waitley received a reduction in Frontier's budget of $64,000. So part of the reason Waitley's is much higher this year is because you're having to climb back to bring you to zero and then adding in the additional state required funding and then our cost share percentage. Wheatley also has an increase in enrollment of um, actual resident students at Frontier in the new year. So that's also part of the reason why that number is a little bit higher. Um, there does seem to be an ebb, of, ebb and flow where if you're seeing a big decrease, you know, if you look back at 2021, Sunderland had a decrease and then 22, they got hit on the opposite side of things where they had a more significant increase. So Deerfield, you could be next with such a low number going into the new year. Um, so 24 might be something where we see Deerfield's number come, at, come back up pretty significantly. Um, oh, and then the one other note is that we did start borrowing um, against the project that was approved, I believe it was in 2019 before I was here. Uh, it was the $1.8 million project, uh, which included the track and some building related things. So we borrowed at this point 930,000. We got incredibly low interest rates on uh, two bands that we pulled out. And so those will come up for maturity in July. So there will be a separate assessment for those, very minor at this point. Do you have the en enrollment numbers handy in front of you, Shelley? I didn't say, or did I miss them? Um, no, I just had the summary on here for you. Uh, let me look, pull up the actual. Moment. So for the 2022 assessment, we are looking at 434 students um, for just that one year. Over the five years for the rolling enrollment, it's the 2330 as the total. And DESE bases theirs on 515 students. Well, I was just looking for Waitley's changes so Brian and Paul could see them. Okay. Yeah. So the state is saying that there is an increase of five students uh, based on their Chapter 70 formula. And uh, based on our five year rolling enrollment, we added seven um, in the new year. Mm hmm. That is the end of my presentation, but I'm happy to take questions. And Darius, if I left anything out, or Bill, or anyone else on the subcommittee, please jump in and help me out. Darius, you want to talk, you want uh, townspeople to talk, or do you want school committee to talk first? However you want to do it, Bob. I got nothing to add, and I think it's you know I just open it up. I think there's okay. nothing. Everybody, everybody pretty much knows everybody in the room here. Yeah. So why don't we why don't we have any school committee members if they have any any thoughts or anything they want to say first, and then we can have the townspeople second talk about it. Raise your hand. Judy raised your hand. Go ahead, Judy. Can I just get a reminder of the position that's included in the budget and the two that were eliminated from the between the five and the three percent increase? Yep. So we had asked for a uh building monitor position so a support position we have eliminated that and we were looking to add a faculty position uh george has been able to work with his team and reshuffle and reconfigure based on enrollment numbers for next year so that faculty position was removed the position that is staying in the budget is an additional ia position based on uh, anticipated rising sixth graders so the incoming seventh grade class we are going to need an additional IA to support that that grade. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other school committee members? 
If not, uh, Paul, I know you might have some questions. Sure. Thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, just generally, there is a subcommittee that constructs this budget or works with the administration to construct the budget, right? Which, who is on that committee? There's, I am the chairman. And who else? Mary Raymond, Keith McFarland, and Phil Cantor. Okay. So this, this next question goes to yourself and those other individuals. When you sit down to look at the budget that's been presented to you from the administration, do you have in front of you the spending habits of these departments over time? I'm, 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 I'm not following what we're looking for. What I'm, what I'm wondering is when you make a decision, so let's just say, let's just say when I look at the superintendent, the, the, that department, can you look back five years and see what that department has, what their spending pattern has been over time and what the spending percentage is in the last year coming into this year so you can determine their rate of spend and how much they really need and how much is still in reserve. But more importantly, how they spend money over time. Do you get to see that from the, the accountant? All the members of the school committee see the, see the expenditure statements every month. But I, I, I can't say that we see them grouped together like look to be able to look back at five years at a time. <clears throat> okay. Right. Well, it's just um, I, I would just think that that would be something that you'd want to be able to take a look at. Um, you know, for instance, we go back. Uh, Shelly just showed us. You know, the last three years of uh, what the spending looked like. And that's an interesting view. And it's something that we should all have. But I would think that when it comes to the sports department, when it comes to, uh, you know, when I look here, when it comes to girls basketball or track coach or any, any of those line items, what is the spending pattern over time? And, um, and I, I, it would be something that I would want to know. We do that in town. We look at what a certain department has spent, what percentage did they spent based on what was approved. All of those factors go into whether or not we say, yeah, this is a good thing for the town. Um, but we just don't take the department's numbers at face value and just compare it to, you know, can we afford it or not? Um, so that was my question and um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. I think that the best way that I can answer that is that I, I have to depend as a budget person and a school committee person on the administration to present me with the numbers that they have done the research on and that they have looked at. I think, I think they do that. I've been doing this a while. And, and in fact, I'm sure they do that because that's, that's the way the whole process goes. And it, it, it's, you know, it kind of gets narrower as it goes. It starts, it starts as a, a very large operation between George and Darius and Shelly. And then it, sure. it comes to us the first time. It may come to us the second, third time, some years, a fourth time before it gets to it. But yeah. I, that kind of stuff that you're looking at, Paul, I think is done by them and not by us. Okay. So I, so that would lead me to another question in that, how do you push back? If they're giving you a number for any department, how do you push back against the number that they are presenting to you? Because that's what it is. It's a give, give and take. There are no bad guys and good guys here. We're all on the same, we're all on the same team. But there has to be this, this ebb and flow to the process. And if you're not pushing back and challenging, 
based on this history um, of how a department or how a school is spending money, uh, then I just don't know how that pushback comes about. And maybe it does, and I, I'm just not aware of it. So. Shelly or Darius, do you want to chime in at all on this? I mean, I, can, I, mean, I see Keith's got his hand up, but yeah. I, the only thing I'd throw in there is that when you're talking about budget lines and what lines there's movement on, you're not, you know, we're not talking, we're talking about the, you're talking about giving athletics as an example. We haven't adjusted the, the, the budget lines of athletics outside of um, coaches' salaries in the sense of either they've increased with either the contract or they've increased or decreased with whoever we hired. We haven't changed the amount of money we've given for balls and shirts um, in since I've been here. You know what I mean? So um, I think there was some adjustment this year to the, for the new sports, but most of the line items in the, in the, in the school are based on um, you know, either uh, our salary based or you know uh, operations in the sense of from insurances to those kind of things. Shelly could probably go into more details of that. So um, and you know within your savings in those lines. You, you may get bigger swings and stuff that have volatility to them. You know what I mean? So a utility line may have volatility to them. So in the last couple of years are, are, are a terrible market to look back on because we haven't been fully operational or we were paying extra money in certain areas that, you know, we're trying to come back out of that now to have a normal um, operational year for next year is, is the hope and game plan. Um, but yeah, we do look at those things and where those some of those savings are and shift things around. Um, and then that goes into where do, where do we need increases or where we decrease or move things from one thing to another. So that does take place. Um, the amount of, I mean, it, you're talking about the amount of money that the frontier budget is, um, the amount of line items and that kind of stuff, that's a, you know, if you wanted that all broken down, I mean, Shelly could do some sort of that, but that's a lot of line items to break down. Um, so you'd have to kind of look at different areas you'd want to concentrate in, I guess. I right. Say. And I certainly don't want those numbers. I can guarantee you that. But my question is, was simply the budget subcommittee, when they look at this, how did they determine whether or not to say yes or no? And I, or to ask for a change or to ask, ask for a de decrease or an increase. Um, so, um, you, you know, if, if for whatever, if the chemistry department at Frontier all of a sudden has a 17% increase, well, why? Uh, obviously, you would know that. That would be an opportunity to have a discussion and either push back or pull forward. And by the same case, if it dropped by 15%, you'd want to know why. So if those kind of discussions are not happening, um, that's I would be first, interested to know. That's usually, Paul, the first meeting that we have with the budget. Everyone, Keith can bear this out or Mary or anyone else, has gone through the thing and they'll go and we'll go page by page and we'll look for those. If people have questions about why is this one up? Why is this one down? We'll go through it and we will, as budget subcommittee members, receive the explanation from administration on why these things go. They'll break them out. Shelly's done it. Don Scott used to do it. Break them out for us, the big ones, either up or down. Break them out so we can find them easy. Mm -hmm. And we'll ask questions about those and we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Like the uh, this year's English teacher, for example, it was proposed, but George has realigned the staff and done things so we will have an additional English teacher on staff, one more than we have now next year, but it, it comes from a shifting of of uh, numbers of staff people around people teaching different things. So, so when we ask questions about that, we want to keep the English teacher, is what we told them. Figure out how you can do that. That's when George went to work and realigned the staff and we were able to hire the extra English teacher with savings elsewhere. Those are the kind of discussions that we have as a budget subcommittee with administration. I know that Keith and I saw Brian had his hand up also, but if I can just make one other comment when we're talking about, you know, individual line items and departments, 
um, and I think Darius tried to say this, is there's not a lot of fluctuation in things such as supplies and materials, equipment. The majority of our changes in the budget are salary related. Um, of the $430,000 increase that's presented, 240,000 of that is salaries and wages. So over 50% is salary driven, whether that's increases or movement of things to different off of revolving funds onto budget, the majority of the increase is salary driven. You know, the other pieces tend to be more, um, operational, such as facilities or IT, you know, and, and we do look at those really closely. Um, and, and as Bill said, the, the committee, subcommittee or the full committee is, you know, they get the full budget just like you got today, Paul, you saw the line by line, you right. know, and it gives mm -hmm. the increase or decrease. So, mm -hmm. you know, people do ask questions and, yeah. and we do talk about those kinds of pieces. Well, when, when the finance committee gets a budget like this, and believe me, it was it's well done, and I know you've put in hours in this thing, but it's, to be quite frank, it's a little light um, when you look it over and you try to see, okay, what's in back of this, and how did that come to this number? You really, you, it's, you, you really can't pull it out of this, um, but that aside, I thank you for this, and I'll just, I'm done. Yeah. Paul, we can come back to you. I, I just want to ask Judy first. Do you have a something you want to add quickly, Judy? Get your hands up first. Oh, no, no. I'll... Okay. Uh, Brian, why don't you go next? Hi, thanks. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the um, the impact and trends of, of school choice that we've seen and also um, what, what's, uh, what are we looking for in terms of loss of students to charter schools and how that's gonna, how that's impacting the budget have, and how has the pandemic affected that have, has that really dropped off, has it increased and, and where does that leave us? What's, what's the impact of that sort of financially on the school system? Thanks. So the charter school piece, um, I can't, speak a lot to as far as you know how many students in the new year we're predicting i'm not sure if george has that kind of info um our school choice you know continues to do really well we have about i think 615 students in the district and 440 of them are our local students so our school choice numbers are strong and we anticipate that they'll continue to stay strong we know that we have students coming in um, specifically for some of our athletic programs because their schools don't have a specific sport that students want to play. Um, so I'm, I'm not super concerned about that. Our enrollment has gone down. Um, it is definitely dwindling over the last few years. And I think that, you know, at least the next year, Darius anticipates that that could be the case again based on the elementary class sizes that are coming up over the next few years. Um, you know, we continue to get the same Chapter 70 funding, regardless of that going down. Uh, but, you know, it might be something that we have to look at in the future as far as um, programs and, and staffing and those pieces if our numbers continue to change. Anything else, Brian, you want to ask? Was there, some, was there someone able to comment on, on the charter numbers or no? I don't have those numbers, so I'm sorry. No, I don't know if I don't know if Darius, if you have them. Okay, we can we can get them for you, Brian. Yeah, right. I don't have those in front of me. All right. Uh -huh. thank you. Okay, Damien, you want to go next? Yeah, mine's just really quick. Uh, as uh, Shelly was presenting, uh, I got a message from Trevor McDaniel, and was asking, and then you put down your slide, and I couldn't find it in my emails. What is Deerfield's? Uh, share again it's that the total budget increase is 3.64 and what is Deerfield's 0.98 percent 40,500 0.98 and then what is the amount 40,500 40,500 okay thank you Keith I don't see your hand up but somebody said your hand was up 
Uh, I think it was addressed. I was going to just speak to what Paul was asking, but I think it's been covered. Okay. Thanks, Keith. Anybody else have any questions? If if there's no other questions, um, I'd like to uh, get a motion to approve this budget. So, Bob, just okay. Take, you're going to close. You're going to close the public hearing, and then you're going to open the frontier, the regular meeting, and then uh, when we get to that point in the budget part, of the frontier meeting, they'll vote the budget. Okay. okay. Just that process wise. Okay. So at this time, we're going to close the public uh, public hearing on the proposed FY23 budget, and we're going to open up Frontiers but, uh, meeting at 6.32. And do we have to do a roll call to, to start the meeting? No, I don't think That's so. Started. Okay. So the... Um, So are we going to vote on it right this minute or we're going to go go through and do the minutes, Darius? No, you're going to go into your regular agenda and okay. seven or new businesses to vote the budget. Okay. So I'd like, I like to approve the uh, minutes from February 8th. Move to approve, Mr. Chair. Thank I you. second that. And Judy will do a roll call. Yep. Sorry, roll call. Paul? Yes. Lynn? Yeah. Is Phil still absent? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Olivia? Yes. Judy? Yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Yes. Uh, Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. And Bill? Yep. Thank you. And next, uh, Shelly, you want to give us a brief on the our current budget, please? Yep, so I sent you uh, an email with the warrant number. So there were 16 warrants that Bob signed for us uh, since the last meeting. The total on that was $1,696,870.49. Um, I sent you the expense reports. I'm happy to take questions if you have any. You will see at this point in the year, we do have a few expense accounts that are going over. Um, some of them are particularly uh, software and technology related, uh, which is why we're trying to increase the budget for the new year to make sure that we have enough funds to cover those accounts. And then also some facility related items. Uh, the other thing to note that's not yet reflected in the reports, and I didn't give you anything on paper and writing about, is that this past week, we did have a leak in one of our boilers. We have two boilers in the building. Uh, we currently have a boiler down. Uh, I have put in an insurance claim for it as the HVAC company believes it is something that um, was just, you know, kind of random spur of the moment. There is a crack in the header in that boiler. Um, he's unsure if it's able to be repaired at this point. And we have had a virtual inspection with the insurance company and they are sending an inspector out. Hopefully um, by midweek next week, they'll be here. I don't know if the insurance company is going to approve that claim or not. I don't know if they approve it, if it's going to be for repairs or if it's going to be for a replacement. The concern with the uh, current HVAC company is that we may not be able to find the parts because the boiler is original to the building. Um, and that he's also concerned that once it's opened up, you know, you have one small problem and there could be a lot of other things that are not repairable. So I don't want to, you know, send out smoke signals yet and, and cause huge alarm, but this could be um, a significant amount of money that we are looking to have to fund, uh, which, you know, fortunately we do have some revolving funds and school choice funds saved up. But our first step is to see if it'll be covered under our insurance claim, which we'll have a deductible for. You know, and there's always the concern with filing claims, especially large claims, that it could have an impact on your renewals and increasing your rates and those pieces. But if we're talking two, three hundred thousand dollars, it'll be worth it to go through that process with them. So um, I will obviously keep you in the loop. Darius will keep you updated as well. Uh, but that's all the information that I have right now. Can, can we operate the school with one boiler right now? 
Yeah, so the, the this is also very sad, but the, the second boiler also had a problem last week and had an electrical failure right after the first boiler went down. We've been able to bypass the system and we've ordered the parts to fix that one. Um, and as long as we don't get, you know, frigid, frigid, multiple night in a row temps, uh, the HVAC company feels like we'll be okay. So it's getting warm enough in the day to keep the building warm and you know, not having an issue with freezing pipes. Um, but Bill and I are, you know, in conversation about what the weather looks like and, and how we manage that, I, you know, hopefully we can skirt by because if we do have to replace it or if we even need parts, you know, sometimes those parts right now are taking months to get, um, especially for replacement. We could be looking at this being a summer project, hopefully done before fall. Thanks, Shelly. And you know, Shelly said that kind of number in there that the replacement of that boiler is a big number, and that will have to that will change the lineup of our capital projects for next year. But we don't have to jump ahead, but that's the alarmist side of it is that we don't have enough information to give any decisions tonight or even go there. Sorry, um, but um, that is the concern if that if we're on the hook for this, it's going to change our trajectory on some of those other projects. So um, we'll we have more to, more to do there. That's my daughter. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Um, I didn't have anybody that had public comment, but if there's somebody on that that I didn't get by three o'clock, uh, chime on. If you're there, if you're one of the other 11 that's not on the screen. Okay. Uh, reports. Uh, do we have our student council person? Uh, yes, we do. Okay. How you doing? Uh, hi, I'm Amory, and uh, I'm going to call up our mask mandate survey results. Okay. So I'm going to share that. So I'm hoping that everyone can see. Here it comes. So a plurality of respondents at 47.7% said that they believe that the mask mandate should be removed in school. 37.3% uh, said that they did not believe it should be removed. And 15% believe that it should be were undecided. So 38.3% of respondents said that they would continue to wear a mask in school. 408 said that they would not. And 20.9 said that they w might wear a mask in school if the mandate were to be removed. And I will pass it on over to Patrice. Yeah, so I am the other student council representative for tonight's meeting, and I have some statements from students. We sent this um, survey out the week before February break. And so here's some comments for people who would like the mandate or uh, nope, sorry. Yes, here's some comments from students who would like the mandate to be removed. Uh, and all of these comments are anonymous. Uh, the first one says, I think most people that are vaccinated and concerned about COVID will continue to wear masks because of others around us that might not be vaccinated or frequently don't wear masks already outside of school. And I think a test run for a period of time is a good idea, but everyone who is unmasked should do pool testing for the safeties of other in the building. Uh, the next one says, ultimately, I want people to feel safe. I think if we choose to lift the mask mandate, we need to have an assembly to make, to make it clear to people that the science supports the idea that you are safe without a mask and without others wearing a mask. But I still to totally support lifting the mask mandate. I just think it needs to be done so people feel safe. The next student said, I believe that if somebody in the school school has COVID, we should have a temporary mask requirement until the situation is revol resolved. And the final one who was uh, advocating for removing the mask mandate said, it depends on what the COVID cases are and what the percentage of students are fully vaccinated. If we could potentially get a lot more cases because of COVID, uh, a lot more cases of COVID, then no, we shouldn't remove the mandate. If it is safe for students and there isn't a high risk of spreading, then yes, we could remove the mandate. And then I also have four uh, anonymous comments from students about them not wanting the mandate to be removed. 
The first student said, if the mask mandate was removed, I wouldn't feel safe at school. I don't think we're ready to stop wearing masks yet. I don't want to do all I don't want to undo all of the progress of getting rid of COVID-19 in our schools. The next student said, I don't believe that the mandate should be list lifted as it has the potential to reset the progress regarding how little COVID-19 cases we have had in the school building. Also, there are teachers and students with health conditions that make them more susceptible and to more severe COVID-19 cases. Some teachers also have children with similar health conditions, and I think that we should respect their opinion. If anything, they should be able to set their own restrictions in their classrooms that allow for them to feel safe. The next student said, I personally don't like removing this rule because COVID is still pretty serious. With all the interactions and having unvaccinated people, there's a big chance of the spread increasing really fast. If all were vaccinated or if we had high restrictions on social distancing, I think it would have been better. But unfortunately, those rules can't be continued in school due to general reasons. For me, wearing a mask is also not at all bothering. I've gotten really used to it. And the final student who was advocating for keeping the mask mandate in our schools said, uh, there are already too many COVID outbreaks currently. Without the mask mandate, it would only spike. I cannot miss multiple days of three AP classes or potentially lose my spring sports season in junior year. Uh, that Thank is you. all I have. Thank you. Thank you. You guys have anything else? Uh, no, that was pretty much all that the student council has been working on for the past month. Thanks for all the hard work. Have a good night. Thank you, you too. George, how about a principal's report? So I sent it to everybody this uh, this morning. Uh, just a couple of quick a uh, couple of quick things. I wanted to formally recognize Stacey Chapley of of the recipient of our Grimspoon Award um, for this year. She's uh, one of our high school science teachers. Uh, she does a fabulous job, um, and so we just wanted to officially congratulate her uh, on uh, here uh, at school committee this evening uh, for the Grimspoon. Um, we uh, the other pieces of uh, my report basically we're back to early release days starting this Friday. Uh, we're back to, to training. Uh, we're back to anti racism training. We're back to special ed training. Uh, Western uh, Western Mass Writers Workshop is going to be coming in again, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, so that's happening. And then uh, the musical is happening again in a couple of weeks. And I wanted to point out Olivia. Uh, Olivia, let me know that I did have a wrong time on there. Um, so the the it's happening the weekend of the eighteenth. Uh, and it's 7 p.m. Uh, on Friday and Saturday, but on Sunday, the 20th, it's going to be at 2 p.m., not at 1 p.m. So I wanted to just I wanted to just formally put that out there. Uh, and we've got playoffs. A couple of the things we've got playoffs happening uh, this week uh, in girls basketball and boys basketball uh, and hockey. Um, and Bill, um, Bob, I also responded to you about you had a question about the Yankee Candle scholarships. I hope you got yep. my, you got my answer. Right, Thank you. Yeah, Appreciate it. Uh, Darius, you want to give a COVID-19 update? I think the big update is we have a meeting tomorrow um, <laughs> uh, where we'll be discussing the current um, face covering policy. Um, there is a, the state keeps on sending us new guidance and updates, and so I did send something out today that had some minor changes to it um, just because I wanted to get that out on paper. We since received another one since sending that, so we will send that out as well um, when I put it together tomorrow morning. Um, but so, uh, but that's tomorrow night at, it's at 6.30. Just note, it's a small adjustment time. Uh, we had to do that. Um, and it is five separate meetings, not 38 in Frontier. It's all 38 school committees in the Frontier School Committee. So we'll be opening five committees. So, because it's policy affects all five. It's not just the 38 doesn't have a policy. The, um, each of the elementary schools. So everybody will have a, a vote and so on and so forth with that. Um, and it is our meeting, not the Board of Health's meeting. Right. Damien, you have a question? Uh, yeah, Darius, just to clarify, when you talked about it all being separate meetings, um, I guess in theory, can one school keep a mask mandate and then uh, another school yep. not have one? Or, or are we doing this all together? Yeah, the, the idea was, um, so the question was brought to the chairs about whether or not to do a joint meeting or have individual meetings. Um, and there was some 
back and forth on that because there's a diff, you know uh, different opinions on that and different things. The original meetings last year uh, where we were joint, um, I think some school committee members felt there's a you know, there's there's a lot of people. I mean, it was like Parliament, um, and so you know not everybody got a voice or felt they could have a full voice. When you have you know, at that time, we also had boards of health. We had like 35 decision makers in the room. Um, however, the you know, to speak for Bob, your chair there, um, but to, to speak for him, uh, the idea was that if one committee did something different, the other chairs wanted to hear the conversation that led to that decision, and so they said at least we'll be having a discussion together. And then, um, you know, the, the committees can choose not to take action if they wanted to as well. There's no rule that says you have to do something tomorrow night. Um, I mean, I imagine the community is expecting something, but um, that's, that's going to be up to you folks on that. So after the discussion, each committee can decide whether or not they want to take action and then vote that within that meeting. Um, so each chair will say, like, it'll be like, you know, for when Jansen and Waitley would say, Waitley School Committee, how do you, know, blah, 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 first, second voted through that kind of stuff. We'll see where it goes. It's going to be a little bit clunky on that percent of, part of it. Um, I think we do really, I think, you know, we do operate well together as a, even when as a full 25 person committee. Um, so we'll be able to hear the different thoughts on the different directions we can go. Does any, does anybody see any value in the 11 of us being able to have a conversation between the 11 of us before 40 of us get it? in the room at the same time? Yeah, that's a, that's an issue. I, I get it. Um, you know, so. Because they are, we have a different, we have a different set of issues than they do. They have unvaccinated, unvaccinated members of their population due to their age. And we do not have that. We do not have the same kind of problems that they do. We have a different set of guidelines that we should be going by for frontier. And we haven't had a discussion among the 11 of us. And now you're going to add 20 more people to the discussion. I don't know how that takes place without everybody's head exploding. I agree with you. I get it, but I just let you know how we set this up. I asked the chairs how they wanted to do it. So Bob, it's your fault. Um, but, but also you're talking about after you remove frontier, you're talking about with a few absences, you're talking about nine extra people. So, um, you know, the idea was the idea that pushed that we did discuss that whether September Frontier should have a separate meeting. Um, there was the conversation well, if you're sending kids to both schools, people would want to hear the philosophies why different schools are doing different things. You're welcome to have your own meeting if you want. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, we're going to hear everybody tomorrow night, Bill. It's good, it's going to be a long, it's probably going to be a long meeting. I, I uh, right now I think we have five public comments only so far that Donna told me that people want to speak. There's been letters that everybody's been getting from from people, teachers. You know, make sure you try to read them all ahead of time and see what they you know what how they feel. You know, before tomorrow night's meeting. So, Keith, you were first. You want to? You had a question, sir? Olivia, you be next. Where did Keith go? Where did Keith? Oh, sorry. I was just wondering, Darius, if you knew if any members from any of the boards of health are going to be there tomorrow night. Yes, I, I was asked by a school committee member to if the board of health would like to comment on it, and so um, I invited Carolyn to come talk to the committee about how the, she's been in contact with all the boards of health to talk about the boards of health's position on this. So she do that as probably the probably part of the public comment because it's not their meeting. Um, Olivia, oh. I just wanted to check. So the emails that we've been receiving with all of the um, letters, if they didn't say they're going to come and do it, we're not going to read all of those into the meeting and take all that time. We're just going to read them. Excellent. <laughs> well, we're, we're, you're going to read them individually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are a couple that says I'm going to read the following letter at the school committee meeting, in which case they're allowed. They can, right. <laughs> they can, well, they can let you see it ahead of time and then they can read it into the public comment. Yes. Yeah. okay. Um, all the letters for those who did write letters that does get put into the file as part of um, the public record toward this um, uh, meeting. I just think it would take forever if every, all of those were read into the. Yep. Anybody else have any questions before we go on to the next? We're doing the right thing here, and the circus isn't coming to town. 
because we have not had a chance to talk about this and we're going to try to talk about it with a lot of other people and I'm not sure it's the right thing to do. So what do you suggest, Bill? Talk about it tonight underneath our COVID-19 update? I mean, it's on the agenda. I, I, really, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, no. I wouldn't talk about it today on the, on the agenda. You would you would get an open email violation. Yeah. Just because it's not clear enough when we have it clearly stated for tomorrow night. You could, if you could have a general discussion with all committee members and then frontier um, at the end as a frontier meeting, continues the frontier meeting um, to have a discussion regarding frontier only. You could do something like that. Um, you know, I don't think it's going to be, I mean, it could be a long discussion. It's up to the, I mean, it's up to the members about how long it is. There's not a lot of public comment at this point. Um, uh, spoken public comment. There's quite a few. We've gotten a lot of emails. So, I mean, we'll have to see how it works. So it's kind of in motion. I don't know how to alter the, the train right now. Other than, you know, the committee could decide it didn't like the way the conversation went and have another meeting. We could be We could be last tomorrow night, Bill. We don't have to be first. We can let the elementaries do it, and we could be last if that's all right. I'm not sure. I know, I, I know what you mean by we could. Well, be last. there, the four. You're going to have four s separate elementaries voting on this tomorrow night, and then we're going to vote on it or not vote on it. Did Darius? Did you tell me today we could maybe table it if we had to? Right. You, legally, you can table it. I think you do. You know, I would only table it if you can't come to a decision as well. Only only because you're going to cause, I think you're going to cause a greater circus around it. I mean, I think yeah. meet, review the material, come out, see where you are in decision, you know, from yeah. straw polls to whatever about how people are feeling. I don't think based on um, overall reading with different people's thoughts and stuff, we're going to come to a consensus. I think there's going to have to be some hearing things out, maybe modifying things and then and voting on something. Bill, we can, you know, we can go last tomorrow night and, and if, if people aren't happy in our group, you know, the problem is if we put it on hold, we're going to have to wait another whole month unless we have another, unless we have another, uh, another meeting. No, you, just need, you just need 45 for 45, you need 40 hours notice to post the next meeting. Okay. You can post one I'm just saying we're going to have to have another meeting. You would. Okay. Okay. Good luck. Can we else have any questions on this? And I hope everybody could be there tomorrow night too. So, um, so let's go on to new business, and we're gonna FY twenty three budget budget like to vote on it. I'm not sure if there's any more discussion. I'd like to move Should to adopt the number vote? in the um, chat. I put the the whole budget in the chat if anyone wants to include that in the motion. Did That's you see that number, Bill? Yeah, I think I, as long as Judy can see it, so she can put it in the motion. I'd like the Board of School Committee adopt the budget as proposed. Twelve million and whatever. Can somebody read them? I'm on my iPad, so it's I can't find the stupid screen. The button to press to bring up the number again. Twelve million two hundred thirty-seven thousand four hundred ninety-eight dollars. Thank you, and thank Thanks, you, Shelly. That's that's operating budget. Do we have to vote a separate transportation number? Don't we usually that's do that? The whole, that's the whole budget. That's the whole thing. Do we need to to break out the two pieces in the motion, or are we okay to leave it in a lump? I don't think we've broken it out in the past. Bill, we may have, but I don't under, I don't see the legal reason why you'd have to. Well, I know we have. I just don't know why. Yeah. And since Shelly and I don't know why, I'm not sure if it's necessary. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second. Who's that? That was Missy. Oh, thanks, Missy. You're welcome. All right. You guys are ready to vote? Uh, Bob. Yes. Lynn. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Olivia. Yes. Judy, yes. Mary, yes. Uh, Damien, yes. Keith, yes. Uh, Missy, yes. And Bill, yes. 
if I could just make one editorial comment at the end of this thing, I hope that nobody in any of the four towns gets taken to task at town meeting about the budget because aside from the Conway Town Administrator, the Whitley Town Administrator, and two Whitley selectmen, or not, excuse me, one selectman and one the finance chairman, I didn't see anybody else from any other town. Again. Again, to talk about $12 million. I don't understand. I don't understand that. I'm not. I'm not looking for a fight, but I don't get it. Darius, are we presenting to Sunderland separately still, even though the school committee has voted on this already? Yes, they've asked us to attend. Okay. I think Waitley probably has too. Waitley asked us to present it. We they're going to come to the Waitley Elementary Committee meeting, and they asked if I could present the. Frontier yeah. budget for those who weren't there. We're doing that next Tuesday night, Bill. We asked, they asked if they could do it during the Waitley Elementary Schools meeting, and we said yes. Sure, sure, why not? So maybe you might want to be invited to that one too. I can remember when we had a room full of people at Frontier, a finance committee and selectmen, and this. You can sit in a chair just like I'm sitting and listen to this presentation, and no one no one does it. People you actually used to leave their house to come and listen to a presentation about the budget. Nobody does that anymore, and they don't have to leave the house. They don't even have to get out of their pajamas because I'm still in mine. But no one wants to listen. And if anybody starts in on me at the Whaley Town meeting, they're going to get 45 years of pent-up anger over this system. So just don't quit. Run. Don't quit, Bill. I haven't turned my papers in. They're on the counter, Bob, but it's getting closer. Keith, you got a question, sir? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was going to ask if Judy got all that. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's up here. Uh, I'm going to ask is when, when are you going to be, when did someone ask that you present? Good did you question. hear that, Darius? I'm looking. But when, when, when do we have to present to Sund, uh, Sundland? 14th. 14th. Thank you. Yep. And okay, next is April Joint School Committee meeting discussion. Yes, I'm looking for any other agenda items for that meeting. We will be discussing the calendar, professional development plan. Um, and I just want to kind of put it, remind a remind people, and then also if people wanted anything to be discussed and added to that agenda, um, we normally set it up. I'm just, it's more of an announcement to remind people that we do that joint one where we kind of present um, next year's planning. We also will have an update from um, our anti-racism and equity committee and our consultants will give a um, present update and presentation of, of our work there. And so you can ask them questions directly about their, their perspective of things and um, their work with us. So anyway, so I'm building that agenda. It's going to be probably a, it's one of our heavier meetings because it's a lot of stuff that we, instead of doing it five separate times, we're doing it all one evening. Um, and then school calendar as well will be done that night. Darius, is this uh, is this going to be a time that we can get back in person? I might as well bring it up. I was just going to ask that. That's why my hand was up as well. Excellent. I'm sorry, yeah. Olivia. So we are, you know, um, yeah, we can go back in person anytime folks are ready. I think right now, I know people were asking, I like, see the emails regarding the tomorrow nights being to be in person. That was just, I, I think that's just a logistical nightmare. It's not about mask and mask safety in, in my, I mean, some people, no matter what, I have to provide a virtual option. To do a virtual option with 24 school, 25 school committee members, which one hasn't been showing up, but 24 school committee members with public comment virtually and in person, I'd have to do it in the auditorium. I'd have to have a camera crew. I just don't know how I would be able to pull that off of a, of a meeting of that size. And so that's why, you know, there really wasn't a whole lot of, um, entertain the idea of trying to that kind of meeting when we can do it virtually. Um, the you know if you guys want to have the, the joint meeting in person, um, it, we I think we still have to have a virtual component. We do at that point in time, 
um, can figure out how to do that. It's a, you know, it's smaller in comparison to a mask meeting where the last time we talked about masks, we had close to 150 to 200 people on, on, at the meeting. And so, um, anyway, so we can def definitely work that out if we want to do. Okay. Does I mean, the virtual, I, that expires in April? The governor's extension of I thought it was virtual. April twenty second. For some reason, that's, that that's a date that I know of. And there was talk that they were going to extend it until June. Um, so maybe they're going to back that off now because everything's kind of shifting back and shifting back hard. So I don't. I, I can research that, but I believe it was mid April. <clears throat> Olivia, you have a question. I just, I think that we might want to consider whether or not there's any truth or whatever to it. The optics of us, I get for the big meeting, but for us going forward, like in April and such, if a, of us not meeting in person, but then lifting, having all the kids, you know what I mean? If it's okay for everyone to all be together, which I think is fine. Like if it's okay for everyone to all be together, why is it not okay for us to be together? Even though that's not the reason we're doing meetings this way, but the optics we just might want to consider. Right. I've thought about that a lot. And I talked to Darius about that a little bit too about, and I know there was a date of April what, 22nd or whatever there, but we could, you know, if we did, I mean, we did the Capitol meeting in person a couple of weeks ago um, in the library, you know, and some people were virtual and some people were in person um, and it worked out. Um, the problem is when the room gets bigger, I'm going to have to hire some people to, so I'm not sure how good the audio gets when people are having conversations. <clears throat> Livy, you have one more thing? Only just because, well, I know the other, like Maha or like other schools are already meeting and I'm not saying we should, I'm just saying other schools are already doing it. So um, I just, I want to make sure our, what we're saying and what we're doing is, is kind of matching up. Thank you. Missy? Yeah, I also just kind of wonder as we approach that space, whether or not there's some benefit in continuing to have people have more open access to coming to these meetings by attending it virtually. You know, we've had a lot of participation for a lot of different reasons over these last couple of years, but it's certainly more people that have attended these meetings than any of the meetings I had been to previous to me being on the school committee. Mm -hmm. I know that's a small experience, but there there may just generally be, you know, as Bill mentioned, that you can come in your in your PJs. So you know, there's there's this becomes a an easier to access space for people to to attend these meetings and offer hear what we're doing right. and offer their their comments. I just I just think in the future with logistics of, I mean, during our capital meeting was pretty easy. We Darius had something set up in the library. But when we have the bigger meetings and stuff, I mean, it's it's something somebody has to do versus just showing up at a meeting and stuff. And if we're going to practice what we preach tomorrow night, and Olivia's right, maybe, you know, we need to look at being in person, you know, if we can. But it's another discussion for another day, I guess. Maybe I'll have any thought. Actually, you probably should make the decision tonight because I'm going to need to know how to do that meeting next month. I mean, it, it's, I mean, technically, Bob, it, it's it's up to the chair. Um, it's, oh, a, it's a virtual option for everybody. It is. Yep. I mean, it's yep. the chair is to call meetings and yep. set the agenda with the superintendent. So, um, can, so can we just, can, how about if we just wait until after tomorrow night? Right. And I'll, well, I can, I'll have your, I'll ask everybody your opinion. And you can just send me an email or whatever like that, how you guys feel and stuff. But, hey, I don't mind doing it at the dining room table here, and I don't have my BJs on. So, uh, But I, I do like seeing everybody and get, getting back to a routine. I want to get back to if we can. So um, so, so tonight when oh, – The next part of the budget – I mean, the next yeah. part of the question was the to approve the um, – settlement agreement. So the settlement agreement is now completed. The contracts are completed. However, the association wasn't able to have a meeting right before the break. Um, and so they're having a meeting, I think, Allison, you said this week or it's coming up. So so we always voted our budget. This is one of those things that 
because I only did it once, I didn't remember. We always vote after the association votes. So to make sure everything's fine before we do and go there. So um, it'll be on the next agenda or we're gonna have to do a- It'll uh, be it'll be quick and easy. It is, we can't do it tonight. Um, because that we, could do it, we could do it next month. It's just a simple, it's not that difficult, right? Yeah, just to figure out how we're gonna do that with a joint meeting. We may have to okay. have a, a quick meeting maybe like prior to it or something like that. We've done that before. Okay, thanks. And to reports, um, I have nothing. Lynn, do we have anything from the collaborative? Um, I just wanted to give them a bit of a shout out. You know, it's been so crazy the last couple of years, but I was looking over their annual report and it kind of struck me that just this year, um, the collaborative has serviced over 14,000 people from, from birth through retirement. And I just think that's really cool. Um, in a, in a lots of different ways, lots of different services that they provide. Over 14,000 people uh, were helped by the collaborative. And so I just wanted to make a note of that. They're doing really good stuff. Thank you. And Darius, home from, finally got home from vacation. Do you have anything for us today? No, but I made it home. <laughs> If everybody didn't know, Darius got stuck in Florida for a few extra days. So, but he's yeah, home safe and sound. It was really tough on me, although I did leave at three this morning. All right, and we're not going to executive session. I need a motion to adjourn, unless somebody else has anything they want to share. Move to adjourn, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Bill. I'll second that. Olivia. Raise your hands, kids. Yay. Okay, good job. Good night, everybody.